You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Ward, and you're listening to the Sonic Society, the world's largest and longest-running showcase of modern audio drama. This is episode 750. That's right, three-quarters of the way to episode 1,000 for our regular features. You know, if you add up all the other shows, well, we pass that mark some time back. Today, we have a fun-filled triple feature with the first three episodes of Han Apocalypse, The Last Zombie. Well, you know, after the apocalypse has come and gone. So we'll load up the old podjector, remember that, and bring you the show right here on the Sonic Society. So this is the end of the world. Pretty weird, right? No, wait! Hang on before you run away screaming. I know exactly what you're thinking. Uh, probably. 60-40? Let's just take this slow. I promise it'll be a lot easier if I just go ahead and break down the fourth wall now. Yeah, it's gonna be that kind of story. Anyway, I'm Hannah. I was 32 when the world ended, so let's just go with that, yeah? Great. I love reading, listening to music, swimming, oh, and good sushi. Oh, and Italian. I'm pretty much a big ol' sucker for a plate of gnocchi gorgonzola. Ideally, shared by candlelight with a special lady. That's right, gentlemen, no need to apply. Not that I'm exactly in demand these days. That's because, as I'm sure you've probably noticed by now, I'm a zombie. Might even be the last one. That's right, friendo. That pigeon that I'm eating right as we have this lovely afternoon chat wasn't exactly my first choice. Or my second choice, for that matter. But we'll get to all that, I promise. Just stick with me. So... A long, long time ago, the world was filled with humans. Towns and cities. You know, the whole civilization thing? I'm sure you remember, right? Anyway, people had families and went on vacation. It wasn't perfect, and people sort of sucked. But at least we had things. Like shampoo and ice cream. Uh, naturally, someone had to go and fu- fu- fudge that all up. So, da 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 da, zombies happened. Nobody ever really got the full story on why zombies happened, just that they did. Of course, that would inevitably lead to World War Z, which would look a lot different than the book and yet hold some surprising similarities at the same time. One of the biggest and Definitely suckiest exceptions was when things got really bad, humans started deploying these just asshole robots to take care of us. Advanced asshole robots, to be more exact. 
which, to the surprise of absolutely no science fiction fan ever, of course went Skynet on everybody almost immediately, both human and zombie alike. <sighs> but that's a story we'll get into later. So, let's just focus on us for a second before I get sidetracked again. <laughs> You know, I don't know if every zombie has bitchin' internal monologue like I do. Wait, bitchin' isn't a swear, is it? I try not to curse. Uh, what I mean to say is, we don't exactly have a secret language or anything to compare notes, so my zombie expertise really only goes as far as what I know about me. Or her? Uh, us. Anyway, if you're wondering how we stack up to old Hollywood zombies, we're more runners than we are shamblers or walkers. We love loud noises and shiny things. Unlike the Romero Arizes, we don't really ride thanks to this cranked up Wolverine-like regeneration. It does get pretty gross if someone hurts me though, because instead of healing, we just kind of regrow body parts as old ones kind of fall off. It's not pretty, and if the damage is too much, sometimes things grow back wrong. It's as if our bodies forget what we're supposed to look like. Fortunately, we have been able to keep this body mostly unbusted. Speaking about not so pretty, zombies come in a variety of sickly shades, ranging from ghoulish green to a putrid purple, or even a ghastly gray. Oh, so, yeah, eat your heart out, audience. This particular shade of seasick green dead girl pallor is all natural. Hmm, what else? Oh, duh! The reason I'm pretty sure I'm the last of us is because zombies are attracted to other zombies. Not like, uh, sexually. That is a visual I did not need in my own life. Ugh. But physically, we're pack creatures, so when we get within a few miles of each other, we sort of just, um, coagulate. Ugh, I honestly could have picked a better, less gross way to put that, but here we are. I stand by my choices. Truth is, though you might not know it by looking back at the records of seemingly rage-induced hordes of zombies, we actually get really happy when we're together. Unfortunately, we also get really hungry when we're together. I'm not even sure why we eat people and things, to tell you the truth. I never really felt like I'm eating because I need to. Food doesn't help fuel us like it does humans, so... Well, as far as I figure, it's how we show we're happy. Or, uh, want to be happy. You, dear listener, are our dragon sushi roll binge after a rough day. Uh, I suppose you could even say meat is our love language. Pretty messed up, right? Really changes how you see zombies, doesn't it? Well, hold on tight, because I am not done blowing your actual mind. <clears throat> Fine. Maybe it's not going to blow your mind, but let's get back to me and my hearty helping of pigeon delight. <sighs> I can't exactly control most of the things zombie me does. I'm basically what amounts to a backseat driver in my own body. Or maybe it's her body at this point. I'm 90% sure she's had it longer than I did. It's hard to tell precisely how long I've been like this. And if we're being honest, that's been less than easy to deal with. You learn to kind of just go with it after a while, I think. Like, do I feel bad for eating a family of four when I was new? You bet. Not exactly my favorite memory. <laughs> but eventually, you learn that zombie me is just gonna do what zombie me does. After you accept that, the horror of it all kind of gets pretty normal. Which makes sense, right? That your brain either normalizes these things, or you go crazy? <sighs> it could be that it probably does a bit of both. All I know for sure is that if I've got to be stuck in the head of a zombie, then I'm going to do everything I can to get comfortable. Which isn't much, but I have managed to figure out some things. For one, I've gotten pretty good at steering her over the years. As weird as that sounds. Like, sometimes I can stop her from doing something truly stupid. I'm able to get her to stand in the rain so we can shower. And then other times I've been able to get her to put on earphones so that we can listen to music together. Which I think only works because she forgets where the music is actually coming from. 
My wants are pretty simple these days, and my triumphs fairly small. So, even just getting her to listen to me for a moment feels like a monumental achievement. Most of the time, it plays out more like me mentally screaming my wants and needs into a bottomless void while she tries to catch a subsequently eat a butterfly. Which kind of sounds like my pre-zombie romantic life, honestly. Oh, hey! We're moving again! Great! That's great. Done with second breakfast and... On to elevensies, I'm sure. You know what, you might just want to check back in on us later. I have a feeling you have somewhere else to be. And, uh, punch it. Scout entry 772182, Callie checking in. Um, clearing the Toronto ruins before heading back to the Detroit Badlands. Everything's five by five. Nothing really worth reporting about up here. I found a community at the Eaton Center that was mostly just people trying to get by, living in between kill zones. Hey, that would make them the only other sizable outpost we're talking about up here, apart from the McMaster settlement back in Hamilton. Oh, that place was the tits, honestly. At least as far as the other places I've been through over the last couple years. Got to refuel the land spinner there, own the local kids at this neat little arcade they had. And I finally managed to get that screwy hover coil fixed up. Mm, to be fair, they're doing all right up here overall, but... Still nothing like the setup we have at Golden Gate. I am, however, happy to report that the rumors are true. The Canadian remnants do indeed make some good beer. <laughs> oh, still not sure it's better than ours, but it did help with the lingering and, might I say, unwelcome pangs of homesickness a bit. So, uh, yeah, let's just chalk Toronto up as a big ol' write-off overall. The machines still have it locked down tight. All the old zoning seems to be largely intact, so it was easy enough to navigate. The locals tell me that the robots are up to you know, mostly the same old robot things they always are. Manufacturing new bots, annihilating both scavengers and wildlife indiscriminately, while just... generally making life shitty for everyone who's not a tin can. Still no zombies, though. Which is an ongoing plus, that makes it... like, like over a year now since we've had any form of the virus? Mutated or otherwise? But on the negative side, it's been three months since I've had even the slightest contact with any of our scouts. Last blip and upload on the reader was in Maine, and even that wasn't verbal confirmation. Oh boy, which means, technically, that it's time to come home. Ah, that's fucked up, right? On one hand, I'm complaining about being homesick, yet here I am, on the other, bitching to myself about actually going back. I... I guess I... I was just so sure that there would be more out here than this. Yeah, yeah, Golden Gate is great, and we have it better than basically anywhere else I've been, but... Still, I joined up with Scouting Ops because I had to believe there was something more out here. Some bigger settlements? Uh, people who had their shit together? I don't know. There's just nothing. There's just nothing. I don't even get to come back home with some old world artifact or something something cool like the other units did after their long holes when I was a kid. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. <sighs> Maybe this is just it. No more adventures or surprises. No new zombie strains or, or strange mutants. Golden Gate goes on to become the hub of North American reclamation. All zombies dead, and a general overall understanding that the bots aren't budging from their zones anytime soon due to a lack of both ambition and creativity. No more wonder, no more mystery, and no new horizons. I, uh, need to remember to delete this part before uploading it to the sat log. Can't let the boys back home see my throat. No weakness. Cigar-smoking, bubblegum-chewing, tank-girl wannabe Callie doesn't get to have a sentimental side? Yeah, that's how they get you to settle down. 
wife you up and file you in with all the other wholesome prefab families destined to resettle America. Can't think of anything I want to do less with my life, honestly. So, um, uh, best to do what I say, stay feral. If they push it, pop their best suitor in the nose with a quick rabbit punch and smoke more cigars for good measure. The sweater vest wearing breeders will label you as absolutely unfuckable when they find out you're an actual real person and not willing to volunteer for tomorrow's great hope. I'll pass on that shit, please. <clears throat> I'd also like to state for the record that I'm, I'm not a tank girl wannabe. I just think pre apocalypse comics that get everything wrong about the actual apocalypse are fun as fuck. Also, try to tell me this old aviator cap isn't a goddamn look. Wouldn't exactly be opposed to installing a big-ass cannon on the spinner, though. Yeah. Paying absolutely no attention to the very real promise that mounting a machine gun would easily tip this heap over budget in regards to terribly fickle weight allowance. But hey, 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 a girl can dream, right? Oh, Callie signing off. Hello, listener. I'm glad you could join Hannah and Callie for our premiere episode of the new show. Their journey is just beginning, and so too is ours. So remember to check back soon. Hannah Apocalypse has been brought to you by Red Fathom Entertainment and stars Amanda Hufford as Hannah and Abigail Turner as Callie. This episode was written and sound designed by Damien Sidlow, with sensitivity reading and editing by Mac Shepard. We'd love it if you'd stop by and show us some love with maybe a follow on socials. You can find us on Twitter at Hanapoctical and now on Instagram for the first time as Red Fathom Ent. If you like what you hear so far and would like to support the show, as well as other future productions like it, you can be one of the first to do so by visiting Red Fathom over on Patreon. Patreon is, of course, a service that allows you to pitch a few bucks to us monthly to help keep this show going. Every dollar goes to paying our talent and improving the show, helping us bring stories like this one out from post-apocalyptia and straight into your ear holes. Enough of that, though. Until next time, listener. Just in time for our after-lunch exercise. You know, I'm kind of surprised, actually. I, don't get me wrong, happy, but surprised. I don't exactly lead the most exciting life here. I've spent the last hour trying to convince Zombie Me to open an old magazine we found and just stay still with the page in view. Long enough for me to read something, anyway. I'd take an index page at this point. Of course, we had other really cool plans, though. Like trying to reach that same deflated red balloon that's been hanging from a telephone pole on Garside Avenue for, oh, I don't know, maybe the last mm, 12 years or so? It's obviously just as out of reach as it was yesterday and the day before. But maybe today, zombie me. Maybe today is your day. And you know what? Who am I to get in the way of your dreams? Don't you ever give up, you crazy firefly. Anyway... Where did we leave off? I think I was doing a quick round of zombies, facts, and fiction. Something about learning to control my zombie body. 
And clearly failing. Truth be told, you could probably learn everything you need to know about zombies in a few hours. We're not really the most complicated creatures. Maybe we should get into something a little more interesting instead. I can tell you're just dying for another history lesson. Okay, it was 2029. The world had long since descended into idiocracy at that point, but it was on time for a blind date with mediocrity when... Boom! Like a comet smashing into the world, the first zombie showed up and saved us from ourselves. It all started in Florida. Because, of course it did. I've taken to calling the first of us Florida man when I think back to those days, actually. <laughs> oh, it's kind of an inside joke for the pre-apocalypse crowd. Which basically consists of you and me at this point, listener. We're in this together. Bad jokes and all. Anyway... The zombie mob that picked me up was in Ohio. Uh, not that I'm from Ohio. I was actually at a tabletop gaming convention in Columbus, mostly thanks to this girl I used to date introducing me to the wonderful world of Dungeons & Dragons. Honestly, that was probably the best thing I took out of that retrospectively toxic relationship, which had ended a year prior with her drunkenly throwing a shoe at me during a St. Patrick's Day pub tour. But I digress. Before I even knew it, we were rolling dice and eating nice, nice people. I didn't really know we were headed to Rhymesville when I started that sentence, but I'm not proud of it. So we're just gonna keep on keeping on. I do remember that the first person I ate was dressed like a space marine. Oh, ever seen a guy try to run while he's hooked up to what is essentially cosplay coated stilts? <laughs> it's hilarious and tragic. Let me tell you, Zombie Him had no idea how to navigate that awkward predicament. Before anyone really knew what was happening, the zombie horde spilled out from the convention center and right into the bride parade that was still strutting its sexy self down High Street. We descended upon the state of Ohio like a righteous, rainbow-swathed, undead nerd herd of doom, which was, granted, not nearly as awesome as I'm making it sound. In actuality, it was a really gross, absolutely terrifying rampage that helped bring about the end of the world. But I like to apply a healthy, positive dose of zombie revisionist history to the whole event. Besides, we weren't nearly as bad as those stupid robots were. Oh, Jesus Christ. This never works. Zombies are terrible at climbing, and mostly only do so by swarming over one another, which is kind of hard to do when you're the last one left. Zombie me doesn't get that, though, so she'll kind of scurry at the base of the pool for a while until something else catches her attention, which, I guess, actually gives us time to talk about the, ugh, robots. As a zombie, I really have no idea how the whole thing started. All I actually know is that they are super effective at what they do. From what I can tell, they seem to have turf? Like some kind of lame gang that only has one purpose aside from taking up space? If that purpose were to incinerate everyone that comes near them. The first time our horde stumbled into them was actually the last time. As grim as that sounds. I'm sure you're not going to exactly feel sorry for a swarm of flesh-eating monsters, but it was really kind of sad. We had just rampaged through town and picked up a bunch of new friends. Uh, things were looking great. Until, well, just as we were leaving, we heard a really loud noise. It was sort of like something in between a car horn and a fire alarm. It's really kind of hard to explain what they sound like, but the important thing is, we really liked it. And when we really like something, well, you remember, we try to eat it. So naturally, we wanted to eat the noise. And just like that, we were charging over one another at full speed towards the sound. At some point, I started hearing this repetitive popping noise. You know, that same sort of noise you hear coming out of those little electric coil traps they have for flies. By the time I got to the front of the pack, there was like this invisible line or something. And every time one of us crossed over it, they just got zapped like a fly. And then there it was. All of my friends were just... Go on. Except for me. I don't know why she stopped. Um, zombie me, that is. She just stood there. 
while the others rushed past, one after another, right into the line of fire until she was the only one left. I remember I was just staring at that line of robots while they did the same thing back at me. Um, us? Sorry, I still get confused and I don't really know where I end and she begins. After a long time, she turned around and went back to town. We've been here ever since. Nobody really comes here, and for some reason, zombie me doesn't leave. It's pretty much like purgatory. I don't really think that she's sad, or even remembers what happened. Not really, but it is weird, I have to admit. I don't know. Maybe she's just waiting for something? Like new friends she doesn't know are never coming? Maybe she just can't get over what happened. Whatever it is, we haven't been able to move on. Wow, that all sounds pretty lonely, doesn't it? I mean, I guess it, um, it kind of is. I honestly try not to think about that or how I ever considered all of those zombies friends or family or whatever. Zombie psychology at work, I guess. Um, you know, I suddenly don't really feel up for talking right now. If that's okay, well, um... We'll talk again soon. Uh, as long as you promise to come back. I mean, please, come back. For what it's worth, um... I really miss talking to people. Holy shit! All right, or... Getting myself calm in three, two, one, go. Only reporting this because we're required to catalog irregular stops and scavenging expeditions under Code 513 of the Great Roadbook. That, and because I kind of want to brag right now. Why, you might ask. Well, because I just stumbled on a fucking gold mine. No, no, not, not an actual gold mine, mind you. Who gives a shit about that? No, better. It's a comic store! Oh, so, get this, there was some really ugly weather coming in over Sarnia, so I decided against risking it and chose to cut through the Windsor ruins instead. I'm going full sail, lever down to the metal, when I spot a sign in the window of this old brick building. I had a double take and I nearly missed it, but hanging right there in that window is a Batman symbol. Let me repeat, <clears throat> a goddamn Batman symbol! To explain for you fancy pants Golden Gate know-nothings, the Batman was a famous superhero back before the fall. He dressed up as... Okay, it's not important what he dressed up as, but he fought crime. He's like hiding in the shadows and, and, and jumping out of bad guys. If you were screwing around and being a big old D-bag, it was Batman who was coming for your ass. He'd even beat up on, like, actual clowns and their evil clown leader, which is great. As we all know that clowns are only a half step behind zombies and robots for being the worst thing that's ever existed on God's green earth. Huh. Actually, can you imagine what a fucking clown apocalypse would have looked like? All red noses and big shoed assholes like shuffling up on you and your family. <laughs> Horrifying. Anyway, leaving that fresh hell of mental imagery behind and getting back to my find, a Batman symbol in the window can tell a girl a couple things. If it is a house, it's probably the home of a nerd, which is a big bonus in my book and worth checking out. And if it's in a commercial building like this one, it's probably somewhere that sells comics. So I park in the front of the ruin and carefully proceed on foot to find that it's completely wrecked. Yeah, big surprise, I know. A graveyard for comics, just trash everywhere. And I almost gave up on searching through the remains of geekdoms when I find this sealed case and... You're not going to believe this. It's full of classics, preserved titles I've only ever heard rumors of. They're all here. And obscure stuff, too. I'm so excited. I feel like uh, I don't even know. It's probably not healthy how jazzed I am about this. But, but consider for a moment that these stories were my actual life back in Golden Gate before becoming a scout. Or maybe it's fair to say that they were my escape before escaping. So... I want to admit, I've never been more thankful for the auto-rooting functionality on the spinner. <laughs> I was so dreading the trip back home. It's boring as hell. It takes longer than it should, thanks to having to get around all the robot kill zones. So the last thing you normally ever want to do is let this thing pilot itself. Since driving is one of the only things that'll keep you sane during this trip, well, 
Not anymore, baby. Time to dust this thing off, kick up my boots, and get educated on nearly 200-year-old pop culture. Yes! And, as is required, I guess we need to get to the official stuff for this report. Uh... Winds are still a wreck. No sign of civilization anywhere I can see. Original reports read that it had been evacuated when zombies started pouring out of the Detroit Tunnel. It's basically kept that way since. Can you imagine that, though? Must have been some sight. Smart Money's betting border security didn't wear their brown pants to work that day. Because I... I think that this was just before we started dropping robots on the horde problem? I can't be sure exactly. I get a little dusty on East Coast pre-fall history. Especially when everything reads like it's copied off the same generic devastation template. Either way, now that my problem hover coil's fixed, I should be able to avoid picking my way through the tunnel by just skipping over the Detroit River. So, uh, wish me luck. <laughs> Callie is signing off. That's pretty good. Welcome back, listener. It sounds to me like Hannah was happy to see you again. To tell you the truth, we're happy to see you as well. We doubly hope that you're enjoying the experience of post-apocalyptia as we patiently wait for our protagonists to find each other. Just maybe we should be careful what we wish for. I suppose only time will tell about that, though. An Apocalypse has been brought to you by Red Fathom Entertainment and stars Amanda Hufford as Hannah and Abigail Turner as Callie. This episode was written and sound designed by Damien Sidlow, with sensitivity reading and editing by Max Shepard. We'd love it if you'd stop by and show us some love with maybe a follow on socials. You can find us on Twitter at Hanapocticle, and now on Instagram for the first time as Red Fathom Ent. If you like what you hear so far and would like to support the show, as well as other future productions like it, You can be one of the first to do so by visiting Red Fathom over on Patreon. Patreon is, of course, a service that allows you to pitch a few bucks to us monthly to help keep this show going. Every dollar goes to paying our talent and improving the show, helping us bring stories like this one out from post-apocalyptia and straight into your ear holes. Enough of that, though. Until next time, listener. done it this time. Oh no, this can't be happening, this can't be happening. I can't even express how far from good this is. Like, if good was a person, this would be their evil doppelganger with an overly grim goatee who's wearing a turtleneck even though it's in the middle of summer. Never trust a twin that mysteriously shows up out of nowhere sporting a goatee. I'm rambling. Okay, calm down. Take a second, Hannah. Since I'm clearly not going to be able to stop her anytime soon, let me explain what exactly you've just walked into here, dear listener. Spoiler alert! It's crows. It's the flipping crows! Again! That doesn't really clear up anything at all, does it, Hannah? All right, all right. 
Trying to calm down is hard while zombie me charges full speed ahead toward impending disaster. But I'll try for the good of both of us. As the great Jack Nicholson might have said in a movie that has without a doubt gone unreferenced since uh, the beginning of the apocalypse, Goosefraba. Goosefraba. <sighs> okay, I can concede that movies in the 2000s were kind of weird. Anyway, back to the crows. I don't know if you know this, but crows are incredibly intelligent creatures. They're cunning little kleptomaniacs with really long memories. When I was a little girl, my mom actually showed me how to befriend them. All it takes is a few shiny baubles and regular food offerings. Not only will they remember, but they'll actually bring gifts in return. Before you know it, you're working your way into their complex social dynamic. And once you're a part of the murder, you're in for life. Kind of like a bird mafia. You know, you become family. No, seriously, they even teach their, um, crow babies? Oh wait, that's not right. Uh, they're murder chicks. Um, fledgling klepto offspring? <sighs> Whatever, they teach their young to love you. Turns out, crows are not above letting you buy their affection. Conversely, if you make them angry, say if you steal from them or if you hurt them, well, let's just say they'll remember that too. And their hatred for you will be passed down for generations to come. You essentially become public enemy number one. Come to think of it, humans might actually have more in common with crows than I thought. Uh, anyway, that's a topic for when I'm not running through the forest as fast as these tired pink chucks can take me. Especially since I haven't quite mastered teaching zombie me to lace them back up yet. Like I was saying, if you cross those little devils, well, they can be real buggers to people they don't like. And as it turns out, to zombies they don't like. Sometimes they fly down and just peck at us or dive bomb us without warning. Oh, which pretty much just sets her off because of course, somehow, zombie me and the entire crow horde are in some sort of mutual blood feud. Today though, they raise the rivalry to new heights. Do you remember that deflated old balloon she really likes? One that was hanging on the telephone pole over Garside? Well, they took it. Honestly, I've never seen anything hold her attention like this. Well, except maybe that balloon. She's so focused. She's so angry. <sighs> Which means, listener, that you and I are both along for the ride until either they drop that balloon or she gets herself some crow du jour. Which is why I suspect that it was hard for me to calm down just now. Thanks for sticking with me through that, by the way. You remember how I was saying sometimes I can get her to do things? You know, influence her a little bit? As it turns out, it's uh, a two-way street. And sometimes her feelings gurgle back up the proverbial pipe to me, too. So now you see why this is very not good. One of the things that makes zombies so dangerous is that, as far as I know, we don't actually get tired. We chase you for days if we have the attention span to do so. Fortunately for mankind, we're easily tricked, and trust me, we hate that. So technically, this could go on indefinitely. Wait a second, is she stopping? Oh, I've never been so grateful for a short attention span in my entire life! Yes! She's totally lost track of them. Ha! Take that, zombie me! Crows win again! Which is also a win for Hannah. Huge bonus. I will never, ever have to deal with her scrambling after that stupid balloon again. <sighs> now, maybe we can get back to... No. Oh, no, 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 no. This just went from bad to good to way worse. Please don't tell me that was for us. Please, 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 please. Do you remember that sound I told you about before? You know, the one that the robots make? That was it! Okay, just just stay still, Hannah. Listen for the next one before you move. Do this for me, girl, please. Just hold on. Oh my god, it's for the crows! Oh, they're after the crows. Oh, we're not in their territory. Oh, at least not yet. But we are so close. 
And we're running again. Back from whence we came, at least. Oh, I guess it's probably pretty safe to say that zombie me has a memory similar to those damn birds. Oh, uh, sorry for the cursing. What I mean to say is that I guess she remembers that sound and what it means, because she's really not having any of it. It's actually wild. I only just realized that this is the closest that she's ever come back to where it happened. You know, to where we lost the others? Wait, does that mean she... Does that mean she remembers? Uh, Wait, hold on a minute. This is a really weird, kind of difficult revelation that I'm not exactly sure how to process, so just go with me for a moment while I walk through this out loud. Or, uh, you know what I mean. I've been bored out of my actual mind for what amounts to literal decades. Most days the only thing on my schedule, besides a front row seat to the world's loneliest zombie show, is, well, analyzing and dissecting the plot of the world's loneliest zombie show. I thought I knew everything there was to know about our leading lady. I guess I'd kind of just gotten comfortable with her habits and routine. Like, she was just a big, messy, pigeon-eating dog. I know that she likes being happy. She kind of has these learned behaviors that she repeats over and over with gaps in between, filled by pure instinct, like a wild animal. She's never, not once, shown signs that she remembers anything. That she still feels things, you know? Beyond instant gratification, like the balloon. Until now, she's... is... is she afraid? Callie reporting in. Again. I reported more in the last couple days than I have in months. <laughs> ah, whatever. Dear Diary, close call taking that Sarnia off route. I'm not gonna bag myself on making the route shift. There's no way to tell that I'd find what I found out there. A long story short, ran into a gang of scavers set up around the outskirts of Detroit. Like I said before, normally wouldn't have taken the long way around, but I'm glad I did. At least so that we can mark the hazard. You know, not a lot of difference between these types and the raiders these days. Used to be there was, you know. Scaver clans were usually the first to set up the founding of new settlements. They'd band together out of necessity mostly, and families of scroungers and salvagers grouping up to make a living in between kill zones, trading their finds to whoever they came across out there. As a rule, scavers are usually nomadic, but... More and more, we're seeing them settling areas that aren't the kind of hospitable ground a successful clan would normally put stakes at, so... Uh, it's probably safer to say they're bunkering in. As it turns out, ugh, most of these clans were only a few weapons away from realizing that, you know, taking what they need is an easier life than sifting through a bunch of ruins for artifacts. Uh, maybe they just got tired. It's not an easy life, pulling your family around to peddle scraps to the settlements. Ah, still though, not sure if that's worth giving up your humanity for. You know, something changes in you when you come to terms with how much a human life's worth. Yeah. Grim topic for a cloudy morning, I know. Well, the specifics might just turn that around. At least, I found it pretty fucking funny. So there I was, in high gear, banking off some debris, for fun, when I popped over a broken overpass and almost ran straight over their lookout. A guy would have been windshield paced if not for my excellent, no, 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 supernatural reflexes. See, he was armed with an old rifle, and I'm pretty sure he might have taken a shot at yours truly if I hadn't, well, <laughs> caught him in a, a compromising position. Yeah, he was squatting over, pants around his ankles, and leaning hard on said rifle for support. <laughs> oh, so an off-route land spinner was the last thing he'd expect to deal with while trying to pass his morning shit. <laughs> oh, scared him enough that he lost his balance and <laughs> took a good tumble, too. <laughs> last glimpse I got of him was rolling around on the ground half-naked trying to get a bead on me. Oh, 
really wish the window slid down on this thing. Would have loved to add literal insult to injury. <laughs> Here's to missed opportunities. <sighs> anyway, that's the report. Detroit's even less safe now. And way too far away from the Golden Gate for us to do anything about it. Maybe we can get a hold of Ann Arbor and see if they have the manpower to spare? I doubt they can manage it militarily. Who knows, maybe they can figure things out. More settlements, less raiders. It's the only way we get to move past this post-apocalypse as a species. <laughs> uh, Callie, signing off. Hello, listener. It seems no matter how many years go by and how well we think we know ourselves, well, I suppose there's always something more to learn, isn't there? If there is any peace or understanding to be gathered from the bounty of that dusty harvest for Hannah, let's just hope that we're still here to see it. An Apocalypse has been brought to you by Red Fathom Entertainment and stars Amanda Hufford as Hannah and Abigail Turner as Callie. This episode was written and sound designed by Damien Sidlow with sensitivity reading and editing by Mac Shepard. We'd love it if you'd stop by and show us some love with maybe a follow on socials. You can find us on Twitter at Hanapoctical and now on Instagram for the first time as Red Fathom Ent. If you like what you hear so far and would like to support the show, as well as other future productions like it, you can be one of the first to do so by visiting Red Fathom over on Patreon. Patreon is, of course, a service that allows you to pitch a few bucks to us monthly to help keep this show going. Every dollar goes to paying our talent and improving the show, helping us bring stories like this one out from post-apocalyptia and straight into your ear holes. Enough of that, though. Until next time, listener. And that's this week's show. We'll be back next week, hopefully with Mr. David Alt, with some more great and grand features in the world of modern audio drama. In the meantime, check us out at the website at sonicsociety.org or send us an email at sonicsociety at gmail.com. Hey, or meet us on the Twitters or the Facebook groups, including, of course, audio drama, radio drama lovers. Until next week, I'm Jack Ward. Have a lovely day.
classical and brand new audio dramas through the Mutual Audio Network. Subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or iHeartRadio today. There's eight different podcasts, one for each day of the week and genre. And the Mutual Audio Network broadcast feed so you don't miss a day of your favorite shows. Subscribe to Mutual Audio tonight. Good night.